From Microbe TV, this is Matters Microbial, a podcast about the wonders of microbiology, microbiologists, and microbial centrism. This episode was recorded on February 29th, 2024. That's right, leap year day. Hello, Micronauts, and welcome once again to today's Quality Quorum. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Martin, Associate Professor of Biology at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Today is the 31st episode of Matters Microbial. Those of you who watch and or listen and spread the microbial word to others, thank you so very much. First, an announcement. Because I will be out of town next week for a family member's memorial service, we will not have an episode of Matters Microbial next week. But we will be back the week after to share more overwhelming microbial greatness, or OMG as I call it. It's not exactly a member of my Wunderkammer, but something that is always with me. Here is my first tattoo. Oite Pauli Domini is Latin for all hail the small masters. That sentiment is certainly at the center of my intellectual life. I even had the great folks at Hartevel make me a glow-in-the-dark lapel pin with that motto. I'll include links to the reliable Latin translator that I use and Hartevel in the show notes. In my introductory biology course lab component, our goal is, as you know, to isolate possible antibiotic-producing microbes from the environment. Thus, we looked at plates isolated from soil, moss, and lichen samples. Sometimes my students find interesting and amusing colonies, like this one that looks like Pac-Man. But mostly, we saw very diverse microbes on our plates, including this very busy plate from a moss sample. I am just fascinated by all the microbe-microbe interactions and the diversity of what we see. Our goal is to look for interactions that appear to show antibiotic action, like this one from soil. The central reddish colony creates a zone of inhibition in surrounding microbes. Students are isolating such colonies to purity for further testing from their samples. We will do antibiotic testing by spreading an organism on a plate and dotting candidate microbes on it. As you can see here, strain 18A is clearly active against Bacillus subtilis, and N3A is slightly active against that organism. Our goal is to test all of the candidates the students have isolated to purity. This is real science for first-year biology students, and with the Tiny Earth Partnership, we may even find new antibiotics. This is exciting. When I teach microbiology to new students, I remind micronauts that the bacteria appear to have three basic shell cell shapes, spheres called cocci, rods called bacilli, and spirals called spirilla. There are many, many variations on this theme. And this includes the remarkable spirochetes, which can be free living, symbiotic, or pathogenic. Their cell shape and method of motility are well adapted to living in viscous, thick environments. Many spirochetes can be passengers in ticks and thus find their way to people, sometimes causing threats such as Lyme disease. Spirochetes are just fascinating in structure, in motion, and in lifestyle. So it's a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Brian Stevenson, Professor of Microbiology, Immunology, and Molecular Genetics at the University of Kentucky School of Medicine to the podcast to discuss the work that he and his colleagues have done with these twisty microbial critters. Welcome to our Quality Quorum, Brian. I appreciate you joining us today. Thanks for inviting me, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I, I'm really happy that you wrote to me uh, suggesting that maybe you could come on the show and talk about spirochetes, and I think that's a wonderful place to start. So would you mind if I asked a little bit about how you got to be in the position you're in now? How I got into spirochetes? Uh, well, yeah. Um, I got my PhD working with E. coli, uh, gene regulation in E. coli, and I thought it was fascinating. 
And uh, by the time I graduated, uh, it was 1989, and nobody really cared about bacteria anymore. Um, we had antibiotics. And, and, you know, so the colleges, you know, nobody's hiring microbiologists anymore. It's time to move on to cancer or some other kind of thing like that. So I um, took a postdoctoral position at Yale uh, looking at gene regulation and a eukaryotic system. And that didn't really pan out. And I was very lucky that a friend introduced me to a friend who introduced me to his PhD mentor who was studying Lyme disease. And at that time, Lyme had just blown up. It was big news. I was in Connecticut. And Lyme is in Connecticut. And uh, so I started working with Steve Barthold um, at Yale and um, just, just got fascinated with it. And, you know, one of the fun things about that is when I was getting my PhD working with E. coli, and I say, hey, I'm going you know, to tell people what I'm doing. They're like, who cares? And now I can tell people you know, I work with Lyme disease. Like, oh, my God, my uncle died of it, or my dog had it. And, you know, everybody knows about it. So that, that's one of the, um, I, I, I guess, a positive aspect of working. You know, it's something that people are very familiar with. Uh, a lot of concern about it. It is. It's a, it's a substantial disease. And... Um, and it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating disease, and it's an extremely fascinating bacteria. Um, well, I think it's, it, I think it's interesting because of uh, when you talk about Lyme in particular, the interaction of ecology, the interaction of being able to have an organism live within ticks, and then transfer to people. There's so many wonderful questions about it. I, I came at microbiology sort of as uh, someone interested in symbiosis. Uh, I mm -hmm. did work on the root nodule bacteria. Um, in, in, in graduate school. And so that's always been in my mind about it. But really, pathogenesis is a form of symbiosis. The same kinds of issues take place. And when you have different passengers or different vehicles, I should say, for those passengers, it makes it especially interesting. Yeah, it's an intriguing thing about Borrelia and Lyme disease. So, I mean, it, it's, it infects ticks, it infects vertebrates. So two very, very different kinds of hosts. How does it do that? that that's one of the big questions I've been working on. Uh, throughout my career or continuing to work on. And then also when it's inside a tick, when the tick starts to feed, how does the Borrelia know that it's feed? How does it know to stop colonizing the tick midgut, the, the tick stomach, change its whole metabolism? They go from they have not replicated at all to now they're replicating every one or two hours. And they become highly motile and, and they get out of the tick or out of the tick's midgut into the salivary glands. They get injected into the bite site. Now they're starting to interact with human or other vertebrate tissues. So they've got the adhesins that are on there. They've got anti uh, complements and other, other components to help them infect and then disseminate through that body. How do they know where they are? You know, that, that's always been, uh, you know. And so I said my PhD was with an E. coli gene regulation. So when that opportunity came up during my postdoc to study Borrelia gene regulation, like this is exactly what I want to do. I, I can see it niche. This is really critical. And uh, what you know, one of the driving points of our studies are if we can understand how Borrelia knows where it is and regulates to make the right things at the right time for it, perhaps we'll expose some druggable targets so mm -hmm. we can confuse the bacteria so that they think they're not inside a human, they're inside a tick. So they change their metabolism and they start expressing the wrong proteins which now flag them by the immune system or they just can't survive where they are. So you know, that, that's a driving factor. And at the same time, it's just, just fascinating. Uh, these are bacteria that the spirochetes evolved you know, way back a billion or more years ago when the gram-positive types became gram-negatives where they developed the second, their second membrane. It's way back to there that the spirochetes branched off. So it's a very, very deep branch. So a lot of spirochete biology is kind of gram-positive. Some is kind of gram-negative. And others are things that they've cooked up on their own over a billion years of evolution. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun because um, there's the box that's E. coli, and then Borrelia is way outside the box. Uh, e. coli rules don't necessarily apply to so, so if, if you've if you've listened to the podcast, you know that yeah. I rail against what I call the three deadly centrisms, and you and I can agree that eukaryocentrism is a problem. 
Yeah, I, I've got to hold up my cup too. By the way, oh. you should mention what your cup has there. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you can see it. It's um, it's a it's a heart tick. Um, love ticks, which I mean, we well, we use ticks in the laboratory. Uh, it's an integral part to transmission of Lyme disease. And if you really want to study how an animal, how the Corellia and an, and the host vertebrates interact with each other, you really do an infection by tick bite because cultured yeah. Corellia are nothing like the ones that are transmitted by tick. The You're making me are different. You're making me so happy to hear these things. So as I mentioned, eukaryocentrism is, yeah, yeah. is one problem. And then we have oxycentrism. And these are things that all of my students, they have to be kind of taught not to think. But then a lot of microbiologists fall into the trap. And this is relevant to your discussion of what I call coli centrism, that all organisms do what coli does. Sure, we have wonderful tools in E. coli, but I know, having worked with non-E. coli bacteria my whole life, they have a different wild and free life comparatively. Yes. <laughs> and, and so this is a really important thing to consider. And I think a good place to start, especially for the beginning micronauts, is tell them a little bit about the structure of a spirochete and how they do their business. As I understand it, there is an adaptation to living in highly viscous environments. Yeah. So they uh, all spirochetes have two membranes, like a gram negative. Um, they don't stain gram negative. They don't stain at all, really. Uh, either either the gram stains work very well on spirochetes, um, and they have flagella. And unlike a classic gram negative, which the flagella would stick out into the environment and then spin around in the water and acting like a propeller to make E. coli or pseudomonas spun around. In all of the spirochetes, the flagella come out of the inner membrane and then they go through the periplasm along the length of the bacteria. And they wrap around the inner membrane and then the outer membrane is on top of the flagella. So... And they, the flagellum itself is helical, sort of like E. coli's flagella are helical. But in the case of a spirochete, so if the helix, say, turns this way, what they get actually bent backwards to, to wrap around the inner membrane. So if you can imagine a spring, if you took a spring and twisted it all the way around backwards, there's a lot of force where the spring is trying to straighten itself back out to go into the helicity wants. And that, because it's pressing against the membrane, the inner membrane of the Borrelia, is what creates that spiral structure. And then as the flagella, um, and they look a lot like your classic E. coli or the bacteria flagella, there's a rotor sits in the inter inner membrane with a stator coming out with a, with a hook. But the hook is highly flexible. And then the flagellar filament goes along the length of the bacteria. And so as the rotor turns, that hook also kind of kind of rotates, but it keeps pointing in the same direction. So it has the effect of making the flagellum rotate. And as the flagellum rotates, it forces the body to rotate. Mm. So the inner membrane, the cytoplasm, the paraplasmic cylinder rotate. And then the outer membrane just kind of goes along with it. <laughs> So it's is really good because now it makes it into a corkscrew. So that's very, very good at getting through solid material, through viscous material, as, as you mentioned earlier. So if we look at them that they've been growing in agarose, uh, they just zip across the across the slide. If we have them in a liquid broth and look at the Borrelia, they just sit and they spit because they need something to sink their teeth into uh, to grab onto. So in water, they're kind of useless. Um, but in a viscous material. So it worked very well in mud, so the free living bacteria inside a human body, so Borrelia, uh, Treponema pallidum, the agent of syphilis is also a spirochete, highly invasive bacteria. They just drill through solid material. It's amazing uh, stuff. I, I remember yeah. some of them live within the um, gin gingival pockets yeah. of, uh, of your teeth, which people don't want to think about, but it's certainly true. Right. We have loads of bacteria inside our mouths, including some oral treponemes. And uh, they're, they're a significant problem with periodontitis. It's natural to have a few, but when your, your your periodontal pocket gets inflamed, they're happy to take advantage of that. They get in and they, they cause massive destruction. 
So this is a really nice introduction to right. what goes on with spirochetes. I'll put a nice review article, perhaps even one by you, in the hey. show notes. And and you know the whole idea is well hopefully maybe I'll post some videos of of them of them swimming about which is really interesting. I I find it fo you know the whole Christy Spira story, and and I was at Woods Hole when people first started talking about it. There's a particular area in an oyster with very viscous material, and there's mm. a species of spirochete that live just there. And and they don't do any harm, but they seem not to do any benefit either. So it's a really – I mean, yeah. microbes are so good at eking out a living in so many diverse environments. It's yeah. not a surprise that they would try and eke out a living in animals. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, so as you – are a big place for uh, oh, spirochetes as well. Loads of so, spirochetes. And the room – Very complex yeah. interactions uh, that they have with themselves and with other – bacteria in the gut and the germ. So I really like the way that you emphasize the way that they're moving with that wonderful internal flagellum. It's not really an internal one. I understand it's a little different, but you can call it an endoflagellum. Endo, endoflagellum is a typical phrase, yeah. Yeah. Fascinating stuff, well adapted to the environment in which they wish wish to prosper. And, and then we move on to the fact that you say that there's such a deep branch evolutionarily that there are going to be some things about the way that they negotiate life that we're used to from some of the more commonly studied bacteria, but they're going to have their own agenda too because they're pretty ancient yeah. uh, in terms of their style. And, and, and so that leads us to the fact of, of your primary focus has been on a particular spirochete that causes the disease that we're talking about, Lyme disease. And talk a little bit perhaps now about the life cycle. You can kind of take us through, you, you did a little bit, but take us one more time through where they are. Sure. So uh, Lyme disease is caused by Borrelli burgdorferi. Uh, it was named after Willie Burgdorfer, who was, uh, who was a researcher at Rocky Mountain Laboratories, NIH in Montana, which is where I had the fortune to do a uh, postdoctoral research. Uh, Willie had retired, but I did meet him a few times before he passed away. Um, it is a tick transmitted uh, disease, and only certain species of tick can do it. Only species of the tick, uh, excuse me, of the tick genus Ixodes are capable of transmitting uh, Borrelia burgdorferi. Uh, Borrelia cannot colonize and be transmitted by other kinds of ticks. So, dog ticks and other sort of things, that's those are not a problem, but they've got their own diseases. You can get Rocky Mountain spotted fever and that'll kill you. But, um, you know, there's only certain kinds of ticks. Uh, mosquitoes can't transmit it, other biting things. But if a tick attaches to a person and feeds, uh, it takes, you know, it's, it's calculated probably a couple of days. And, and we've measured it. It does take a while for the Borrelia because they're in the mid-gut of the tick, uh, which is essentially the stomach of the tick. And as the tick starts to bring in blood, the bacteria sense that, they go through a lot of changes, as I said, they start replicating very rapidly, they become highly motile, they penetrate through the mid-gut of the tick, uh, as the gut expands, the cells contract, and so little gaps between the cells become quite narrow, so it's a lot easier for the Borrelia to get out. They somehow get into the salivary glands, they're injected with the saliva, they get into the human or other vertebrate, start interacting with tissue, disseminate throughout the body, set up housekeeping, they, as far as we know, they can live for the lifetime of that vertebrate if it's not been treated with antibiotics. Uh, we've, in the lab, we've kept animals alive for a year. Other people have done it, you know, for much, much longer. So somehow the Borrelia are able to, to do that. And then when another tick um, later attaches onto that animal and starts to feed, the Borrelia sense that the tick is there. So Borrelia is not a bloodborne. It's not like they're coasting around in the blood waiting for a tick to suck them up. The Borrelia come out of where they are, and they target the tick. And so as the tick is taking its blood meal, the Borrelia appear, and then they get sucked up inside the tick. And now they get into the mid of this tick, and they replicate. Now they attach to it, and they persist through the malts, and then the cycle starts again. So it's a complicated system. For Borrelia, as you can imagine, there's a lot of tissues going on, a lot of tissues in a tick, a lot of tissues in a mammal. And just being in a mammal is not 
on point. It's, there's multiple points. So how does Borrelia know where it is, and how does it make those changes? And uh, I believe I said uh, that's that's a major focus of our research is how does it know where it is, and how does it take that information and then regulate gene and protein expression? And I started working on that when I was as a postdoc at Rocky Mountain Laboratories. And, uh, my mentors were the first to identify gene regulation in, in Borrelia. So I said, like I said, that's really cool. That's what I want to do. And so I looked to see, are there any other antigenic proteins? And I found there's a number of antigenic proteins that are upregulated during tick feeding. And so we've been chasing down What's the mechanism? How do they do that? And I initially thought, because we learned E. coli in the LAC opera, and there's going to be a specific DNA binding protein that measures something in the blood or something else that comes on and it turns them on or turns them off. And that's totally wrong. Uh, we, we've got a pretty good idea of what's going on, but it is not as simple as we expected. And I love this idea because I didn't know about this. It makes sense as you say it, that it's not really bloodborne. So when a tick is feeding on an infected animal, the spirochetes have to move to where that tick is. Yep. And since I know that ticks will hold, will feed, I, I'm presuming it's the same in, in all mammals. I don't know. Um, for quite a while, this is necessary. Otherwise, the spirochetes wouldn't have time to get there. Yeah. The, the ticks are going to feed for several days. A larva mm -hmm. might feed for three, four days, a, a nymph maybe a week, adults also about a week. Uh, so, yeah, Borelli have a lot of time to both when they're inside the tick to adapt to get to the salivary glands, to, to mosey on out, because it's not like not like a mosquito where it's a few minutes. You've got days. And a similar sort of thing for when a tick is getting acquiring it from an infected vertebrate. There's several days for the bacteria to get to it. And that, I think, in a lot of ways makes it easier on the Borrelia because they can hide out. We know they like cartilaginous material or, or being inside skin. So places where there's, not a lot, there's no blood, not a lot of serum, not a lot of antibodies, not a lot of wandering phagocytic cells that might heat them. Um, so that's a good place to hide. And then if you can sense something in tick saliva and then chemotax towards it, you're only exposed for a brief amount of time. Whereas if they're in the blood, you know, they've got to worry about antibodies and macrophages and everything else all of the time. So it's an interesting the way that they've adapted their lives to the feeding habits of the tick. So they don't actually travel through the bloodstream. After the initial infection, they are found in the blood for a couple of days. Okay. But that's okay. about it. So they seem to spread throughout the body, but then they get out of the bloodstream, uh, probably because antibodies are starting to accumulate and, and they're clearing what's left in the blood. So hurry up, disseminate, get out, make your adaptations, and, and lie down low. It's so interesting to think about all the different parts of the human body as different uh, – well, the whole body is an ecosystem, different ecological niches, different organisms taking advantage of this. And you know, coming at it from a symbiotic background, that's not really surprising to me. Mm -hmm. But looking at it from the spirochetes' point of view, you know, they move – and there is something like an immune system in ticks, and I want to talk about that. But when it gets into people – and it starts off most commonly in deer. Am I correct with that? No, no, no. It, it's referred to as the deer tick because the adults like to feed on deer. Uh, but the, the the younger stages of the tick. So uh, Ixodes ticks have three stages of life, uh, post-embryonic, and each one feeds once. So the egg hatches and out comes a larva. The larva feeds once, molts into a nymph. The nymph feeds once, molts into an adult. And if it's an adult female, she feeds to get food to lay eggs. And if it's an adult male, he finds females. Uh, they don't feed. So deer are required for the adults, but the the um, the juveniles, the larger and the nymphs tend to feed on small animals. So in endemic places like the Northeast, where it's well studied, they tend to feed on mice and then the adults on a deer. And, and so the yep. deer is actually, even if an adult could transmit, or, or, or if an adult could acquire it, the, the female is just going to feed once and then die. So she'd be a dead end. And by and large, deer are considered to be dead end hosts. 
And there's a fair bit of data that many deer can't get infected because there's a Borrelia never needed to evolve to infect deer. This so is it, it's really- a it's a rodent and uh, and also birds and in some places uh, lizards. This is really important because the way that I heard it is that as we messed with the local ecology in the Northeast, many more deer and more opportunity for this. But you've just told us that's not really the case. Yeah, there are a lot of deer, but the real issue about the transmission has to do with rodents and, as you say, perhaps birds, and then they get to us. I think, if you don't mind my saying, Brian, that some people think of parasites like this as like... Um, for mosquitoes, flying syringes. And and I can understand them thinking so, but it's very specific in many cases. And yeah. that's what I appreciate hearing. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, the Borrelia are adapted to Ixodes ticks to interact with their mid gut, to get into the ticks, at those tick salivary glands and everything else. There's a lot of interactions. It's not, like you said, it's, they're not just flying syringes or they, crawling syringes. And this is really important, as I say, because many people have that thought. As you say, lots of people have heard of, for example, Lyme's disease. They probably have heard, oh, you must help me. What is the spirochete-borne disease that causes allergies to red meat? Help me with this. It's not associated with a spirochete, but it is associated with a tick. So uh, there's evidence amblyoma, which is no, amblyoma americana, which is known as the lone star tick, and appears to be associated with an allergy to something in the tick saliva. Wow! So it's complete. It's it's not an infectious disease, is it? It appears to be an acquired allergy. This is uh, really they're, good they're to hear the, again. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're not the sole agent. And just getting bitten by an amblyoma is not going to give you red meat allergy. Mm-hmm. But there's substantial data linking the two. Well, I mean, one of the things that I like about spirochetes in general, the ones that are invading um, mammals, is they have the ability to camouflage themselves from the immune system. And in doing and- so, sometimes lead to the immune system getting, please forgive me, a little deranged. And that's responsible for some of what we see. Before I hear about that, could you talk a little bit about how you, because you must, raise ticks? Uh, (laughs) Well, by far the easiest is we buy um, uh, our fertilized females. Uh, Oklahoma State University Tick Lab uh, rears several kinds of ticks. And uh, so we could buy a a gravid female. Uh, It's been a few years, not terribly expensive. And it's quite fascinating. A female tick, because her life, you know, we think they want to live forever. No, her life is to get as much blood as possible and lay as many eggs as possible. And a female tick doesn't just like lay eggs and walk away. It basically just erupts this massive eggs and my impression is like every bit of tissue in her body that could be used to make an egg becomes an egg it's really quite something to see and uh, another related to that so the first time we raised ticks in the lab where we had them and we put the females in um uh, in test tubes in an incubator and, you know, watching the egg masses. And the tick will lay maybe a couple of thousand eggs, uh, little tiny things per, per tick. Watching the egg masses and looking under a microscope with a dissecting microscope, you can see like the little creatures are inside and starting to move and start to develop. Then I, I recall the first time watching one hatch. And it was like watching a Disney movie, you know, where the, you know, the little baby chicky. You know, the, the egg opens up and out comes the little chicken or the little duckling or whatever. It's like, wow, beautiful miracle of life. Except the thing that was coming out was like the creature from Alien. It was like, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> it was <laughs> heartwarming and terrifying at the same time. It's amazing. Uh, and then, so then after we get the larvae, we, we let them um, uh, let their exoskeletons harden up for about a month or so and get good and hungry. Uh, and then we can put them on mice. And um, 
So mice that we've say infected by, uh, we in that case we just infected the mice by needle because we just want them to be infected. Put the ticks onto the mice, they'll acquire the infection. We can look at the Borrelia as they're coming into the tick by looking, you know, even taking ticks off, and see what Borrelia are making as they're getting picked up by the tick. After the ticks finish feeding, they drop off, they digest their blood meal. We can still look at the Borrelia in it. And then they'll go through a malt and the larvae now turn into nymphs, which are slightly larger. They've got another pair of legs. Uh, I, I will uh, throw in an aside that uh, ticks are arachnids. They have eight legs. They're not insects. Uh, so the nymphs have uh, eight legs. And so we can look at the Borrelia inside of the tick. And then we can take the nymphs and put those on naive mice, mice that have not been infected, and look at the whole infection process. Both what happens inside the tick during transmission into the mouse and then throughout the mouse's infection. So it's, it takes a lot of work. Um, they're tiny little things, and, um, but it's you know, one of I, those things you have to do. I really like the way that you're describing the fact that you really need both factors. You need both. Well, they're both hosts, aren't they? Yes. Um, you need to look at what happens in the tick and you need to know what happens in the mouse and just injecting into the mouse isn't necessarily going to be the same thing as what the tick is doing when it in introduces it. Correct. And that's a really important distinction to, to draw, I think. Yeah. So, so, again, oh, okay. so yes, when we grow Borelli in culture, they are very confused. They're in an unnatural environment. And they are producing proteins that they normally would make inside a tick. And they're also making some proteins they normally make inside a mammal. And they're also not making a lot of proteins. Um, so, you know, we refer to them as confused. Uh, we can do things in culture and manipulate them and get them to regulate genes and, and proteins. And so we can understand things in culture, but it, it's really it's just a mimic uh, of what's happening in real life. So if one takes cultured Borrelia and try to inject them into a mouse, something like 90, 95% of those bacteria die yeah, immediately. They're not ready to infect. They're not making the right things. And as a consequence, the responses of the animal are very, very different from what they would to a tick bite because now they're exposed to dead Borrelia. And so the, the, the flagella that were inside are now on the outside. That's a stimulator of the immune system. There's a lot of lipoproteins there, There's a lot of other components. And so the whole response of the animal uh, to injected Borrelia is very, very different from what you do uh, in a tick. And that, that's uh, another one of the things I'm really grateful to having learned from my postdoc mentors is, is using the tick model. Uh, they taught me that. And for a long time, we, were, we, we really got it going. And now I believe it's pretty much standard that a lot of people in the field. That's wonderful because it really does. I, I, I worry a lot about too much emphasis on growing things in culture because that's yeah. not really what life is. And I make a joke of it that the hand of Darwin is on all that lives. So actually evolution is taking place all the time. We want to make sure that you're actually studying what you want to study. Yes. And, and, and that's the point that you're making. So what kinds of things do you think tell Borrelia that it's inside of a tick versus inside of a mammal? Well, as I said, when I started, I thought I was looking for a lack repressor. Um, we, um, and it was also lucky that uh, when I was at Rocky Mountain Labs, we developed the, the basic genetic tools. When I started in 1994, there was no genetics for Borrelia. And during the next five, six years, we developed a lot of tools. Now we can transform them. Lots of selectable markers. We've got plasmids. You can knock things out. Uh, with some colleagues and I published on CRISPR interference last year, so we can knock down genes and bring them back up and see what happens. So it's, it's become a, I say it's not quite E. coli, but it's, it's I'd say, certainly genetically tractable uh, bacteria. And... So when Tom and Patty, so Patty was my postdoc mentor, and Tom uh, Schwann was another senior investigator at RML, and they did the first studies, and they showed this protein called Aristarchus protein C, OSP-C, is upregulated in the feeding tick. And then 
did some studies uh, in culture and found that if you grow Borelli at 23 degrees, they don't make OSPC. But if you dilute those bacteria into fresh media and grow them at 35, 37 degrees, suddenly OSPC goes up. So the initial idea was there's a temperature sensor, like ambient temperature, you know they're inside a tick. Blood temperature, you know they're inside a mammal or inside a feeding tick. So that was the approach that we've taken. Now, the beautiful thing is in culture, we can do that. So we can see regulation and sort out what is happening in here. And so as we developed genetic tools, we did as one as a bacterial geneticist does. We made fusions where green fluorescent protein with the promoter for the genes, the genes that I was studying called ERPs. So the ERP promoter and a bunch of upstream DNA fused to GFP, put it in Borrelia. I got green Borrelia. And I got, as an aside there, when the opportunity to make lime green Borrelia came up, it's just like you got to jump on that. Yeah. Good joke. Yeah. Other than they're, they're amazing, too. Um, and then, okay, and then we grow them at the temperatures and we saw regulation. So now you start chopping away pieces of DNA. And we found that we could get up to just upstream of the promoter. We said, oh, regulation. Get rid of that. And it was constitutive high-level expression. That is the operator. That is the region we need to look at. So we went fishing. We did some EMSAs, electrophoretic mobility shift assays, which is a way of analyzing does a protein or something else interact with DNA. And yes, there are things in the cytoplasm that bind to that region. We went fishing with that DNA as bait and pulled out three proteins, identified all three proteins, so we know how they work together to regulate the herbs. None of those are temperature dependent. They, they work just as well at any other temp at any temperature. Uh, so th there's there's no temperature sensor to them. Um, and two of the regulatory factors we pursued because uh, for various reasons, uh, they're on the main chromosome. And so we've been studying how they are regulated. And both of those are regulated by a protein called DNAA. And for those of you who know bacterial genetics, you may have heard of DNAA. DNAA is a protein that is the master regulator of chromosomal replication. It interacts with the origin of replication and says, okay, start replicating. In other bacteria, DNAA also regulates various genes that might have something to do with DNA replication. So that left us with a puzzle. Okay, we've got DNAA is controlling two of our regulatory proteins, which control the production of the ERP proteins. Um, and since then, we also started, as I mentioned, OSPC, the first one that Tom and Patty recognized. And I had not been studying that one because when it first came out, several big labs said, we want to study OSPC. Keep obvious. I'm a postdoc. I'm trying to build a career. I'm not going to compete with established laboratories. So I found my own genes and I've been chasing those down. Turns out we don't know anything about OSPC regulation or very little. So we started looking at that. We've identified now two DNA binding proteins that bind upstream of the promoter. One of those is DNAA. And DNAA is a positive regulator of OSPC. And the impact of DNAA is to be a positive regulator of the ERPs. So why would DNA replication be involved in production of uh, surface proteins that are involved in mammalian infection? And our working hypothesis is, so to take a step backwards, as I said, borrelia has got this complicated life cycle, starting a tick to a mammal, recognizing things that are going all along the way. It's complicated, but it's routine. And Borrelli burgdorferi has been doing exactly that same mammal to tick to mammal to tick to mammal to tick for millions of years, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years. No changes. Nothing else happens. It never lives anyplace else like that. So it's not like E. coli or Pseudomonas or other things where they, you know, I don't know where he at. Borrelia always knows exactly where it is because it is stuck in that cycle. And as a result, we hypothesize that Borrelia can recognize certain metabolic features, things that happen to it during that life cycle to know what's going on. And it turns out Borrelia has only got one two-component regulatory system that senses the outside. Everything else is sensing what's going on in the cytoplasm. And so I mentioned when in a Borrelia, in an unfed tick, they don't replicate. But when the tick starts to feed, they now replicate every hour or two. That is the only time in their entire life cycle where they go from not growing 
to growing very rapidly. So we hypothesize, and the data support this, that Borrelia evolved to recognize I wasn't growing fast. I'm not growing fast, so I'm in a tick. Because I know exactly. I'm not replicating, I'm in a tick. But when I go from slow to rapid growth, that's what happens in a feeding tick. So I'm going to have a burst of DNA because I need to replicate. So DNA is going to cascade down and regulate all these various other Pro- proteins that are regulatory factor FC and beeper. And then the ERP operands have evolved to recognize okay, if beeper is high and FC is low, I'm an unfed tick because the DNA is controlling them. But when the balance changes, that's what happens in a feeding tick when you're growing rapidly. So FC is the anti repressor, and beeper, which is a repressor, goes down. And so Borrelia learned to pay attention to. I wasn't growing, now I'm growing. This is and, and an interesting um, corollary to that hypothesis is that the Borrelia not only know where they are and what's happening, but they also know the future. Because if you're in a feeding tick, the thing that comes after feeding tick is you're going to encounter a vertebrate out of animal. So start making these proteins. So OSPC and the ERPs are actually, they're not involved in transmission. They're involved in the mammalian infection. So the Borrelia, when they come out, they don't even know, I need these proteins. These are going to be useful. And so they were ready to go. That's really interesting. Thank you. Wow. So I like the idea that they're, they're anticipating what's going to happen because one particular stimulus is associated in the future a little bit. I like your idea of predicting the future mm-hmm. because normally they're like living a very slow lifestyle in a tick. And then they 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 know because of this very rapid change that it's time to start make the other things that they need to do when they're invading a mammal. Right. Wow, that's really interesting. And then we don't know what the signals are when they get inside a mammal. Uh, they're very hard to study inside a mammal. They're, they're dispersed. There's like one bacteria. It's not like you're going to see a colony to figure out what's going on. Right. So we really don't know, but I'm, I'm guessing something kind of along that same kind of line. There's, there's signals that they're going to be picking up uh, to tell That's them where we are. And um, you know, I, it, it just didn't evolve in a in a vacuum. I'm uh, becoming more and more aware of other pathogens, other microbes that recognize certain conditions to say, "I know where I am," mm-hmm. and, and I'm going to start doing this. Um, you know, it'd be, um, you know, metabolic conditions. I, I'm recognizing something. I know where I am. You know, a, a classic is uh, iron uh, with a lot of microbes. A cool thing about right. Borelli is it does not use iron at all. So most, you know, most life forms need iron for cytochromes and oxidative phosphorylations. Borelli has gone the other option. And it just gets away with it. But there's a lot of pathogens that if there's, Iron is abundance. You know you're out in the environment. If iron becomes restricted, you know you're in a vertebrate host because we don't funny? have yeah. a free iron. So when you get starved for iron, that is a clue. This is time to start making toxins. Turn on your type 3, type 4 secretion and start oh, doing this if you want to survive. And this takes us back to the idea of different organisms as being ecosystems. And if you're going to move from organism to organism, you have to anticipate, you have to be able to perceive. And and I also want to say that, and this is, again, just my philosophy, I think that if you just have one switch, that's not as good as several switches that are additive. And Because, yeah. you know, if you have one switch, it could make a mistake. But having the ability to be more, I don't know, distinguishable about it is, is as I think, something that evolution has done many times. And yeah. that's good to know. No, it's fascinating stuff. Um, Brian, you know, we're, uh, we have maybe about, let's see, we have about 10 more minutes. I thought you might want to tell the audience a little bit about Lyme disease proper because everyone's going to want to know. You've already amazed me with things that I didn't know. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I know you're interested in how the mammal reacts to Borrelia infection. Yeah. So it's interesting that you brought up symbiosis a lot. And my view of Borrelia burgdorferi is it's a commensal, but it gets in us and it's confused. I think we, we find that with a lot of zoonotic diseases. 
their natural host or maybe don't get as sick as we do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we can learn a lot from Borrelia if we look at its natural host. As I said, the, see the white-footed mouse and the ticks in, in New England. Uh, ticks don't get sick. And the paramiscus, uh, the white-footed mice, don't get sick either. Um, and I think there's a, there's a really good reason for that. Evolutionarily, if you, you know, the life of Borrelia burgdorferi depends upon infecting a mouse and staying in that mouse as long as possible to have as many ticks feed on it as possible. That's really strong evolutionary pressure because everything eats mice. And so any Borrelia that ever made a mouse a little bit slower, gave it a little arthritis or a little carditis, got eaten a long time ago. So there's very strong selective pressure on Borrelia to cause no harm at all. Um, unfortunately for us, if you happen to get bitten by a tick which has a strain in Borrelia, which is capable of living inside a human, and not all are, but it is capable of living inside a human, you may have the bad luck that your immune system does see it, and the Borrelia, they're wondering, like, hey, I'm inside a mouse. Wait, I'm, I'm not finding the right adhesives. I'm not finding things. I'm dying. I'm lysing. I'm triggering the immune system. Now people get uh, responses. And it turns out all of the symptoms of Lyme disease, from everything the migraines and expanding red bullseye rash to right. later stages or the, the fever, the malaise early on, later stages like arthritis and carditis and neurological, they're all manifested by the, the patient's immune system. It's all perceiving these bacteria as being alien invaders that we need to fight and it's an over, it's an overly exuberant uh, fight. Uh, you consider Lyme arthritis. It's not that the Borrelia are in there chewing away at the patient's knee. It's their immune system thinks there is something really, really bad there and causing massive inflammation and tissue damage as a way to try to deal with uh, what our immune system perceives as being something really bad. So it's it's a nasty disease. Um, Definitely no fun to have. And, you know, untreated, you can get all those nasty sequelae. And if you get arthritis arthritis or carditis or whatever, that's tissue damage that won't just go away if you right. take an antibiotic because you have damaged tissue, you have scarring and, and, and other aspects of that. So, Brian, if I understand it, if a human gets bitten by a tick that is carrying Borrelia, um, can it then, that infected individual, can another naive tick feeding on the human pick that up and then retransmit it, or is it a dead end? So it's not impossible, and there have been studies with people with Lyme and have been willing to let ticks feed on them, that the ticks will pick up their bacteria. Uh, but by and large, we're, we're biological dead ends. Uh, okay. We're not likely to be fed on by another tick to take feed to repletion. It could are, happen, but by and large, there, it's not. But the only way that a mammal can can get this particular organism is via a tick bite? Uh, via tick bites, there's you know, it's a possibility you know, if they're in the blood, a blood transfusion. Okay. Uh, you know, organ transplant, not impossible. Um, but that would require you know, the, the person would be actively, I guess, in the early stages where there's a lot of Borrelia inside the blood. Um, but by and large, you're going to feel really sick and you should be donating blood if you've got a fever. And, that's and a, you know, it's not impossible, but, but basically it's a tick one disease. You know, whenever we talk about human diseases, it's 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 so difficult because, you, you, you know, sometimes people are at their wits ends trying to figure out what to do or what can be done. But as you say, if you think about what's actually going on, sometimes there aren't things that can be done other than, of course, being very cautious about ticks. Yes. And then some of the work that people like you have been doing might provide ways of helping with that, especially that interaction between the immune system and some of those antigens on uh, that Borrelia is introducing. Yeah, that has become really hot in the last few years. Um, several colleagues are looking at that point. Um, there's a, become an awareness that 
during persistence infections. These are working with mice that are persistently infected. They're, they haven't been treated with antibiotics. That the Borrelia are somehow manipulating the immune system. That it's been known for quite a while that the, the general response to Borrelia burgdorferi during infection is one that's more appropriate for a virus, for an intracellular, than for an extracellular like they are. So it's got somehow it's confusing, and that's a bright thing for the Borrelia, not good for us. Because remember, its goal is to live and not be noticed. Um, there is growing in, uh, information uh, mechanism is still under study or under under studies, but also blocking the maturation of the immune system. So normally, when you're exposed to an antigen, you make IgM, um, and then within a few days, we'll switch and now you make IgG. It's much much better at clearing. The Borrelia slows that, in. And, and so it's it's stopping class switching or making the wrong kind of IgG. Uh, we did, uh, you know, we didn't know what it meant, but it was about 20 years ago. We did a study. We're looking at some mice that were infected, and following them, their serology for a year, and we were seeing waves of IgM showing up six months into the infection, which is like that shouldn't happen. Why is that? And I think it had something to do with this ability to mature or to manipulate the maturation of the immune system, so that proteins are now seen as like oh. Okay, seen this protein before. And now we'll make IgM against it. Well, it was really good. And uh, re really quite interesting. And another colleague, uh, you know, one of my former graduate students, has been studying, uh, he's, he's now a, uh, an associate professor. He's currently at Virginia Tech. He's about to move to Northwestern for Ellen Jutras, uh, studying the peptidoglycan, the cell wall of Borrelia. It is unlike any other peptidoglycan. So it's not like your typical E. coli or other kind of thing. And there's indications that during infection, the bits of peptidoglycan stay behind. And the hypothesis would be that it's different enough. And, you know, you think like, okay, Borrelia wants to stay below the radar. What about if all the peptidoglycan is not highly stimulatory? So it still works, but it's not going to be recognized by cult like receptors. Right. Um, and so... It's probably, you know, bits of bacterial debris that are in there and they're tickling the immune system. Like, there's something here, but I don't really know where it is. And so people can maybe still get inflammation, but there's not enough inflammation, not enough trigger for phagocytic cells or other ones to go there to really clean up the debris because they don't quite know what that is. You know, I, you know, I think that's a... Borrelia's way. Of it. it's, it's, it's not behaving like things that our bodies are used to see. It's really interesting. I mean, I, I hadn't thought about the things that you've discussed with me today, that the normal strategy is not to be noticed. Mm -hmm. And that works very well in the primary host. But then when you get into these other hosts, you have problems because you don't have the handshake that you yeah. have that's been worked on by evolution that allows Borrelia to live. I'm not going to say in, you know, partnership with the mouse, but certainly in a way where they've reached some kind of approach, a, a, a detente, right? Yeah, I mean, there's a number of things that live in our bodies that we ignore because they've evolved to just don't make any noise. Just yeah. stay quiet. It, it, we don't worry about it. Uh, and so one, you know, I, I guess an argument for our research for understanding how Borrelia knows where it is and how does it survive in these different environments is really that's its virulence factor. It's not producing any, Borrelia doesn't make any toxins. It doesn't make anything to try to cause damage. It just has to survive. So that is really its virulence factor. It's just survival. Um, but sort of a uh, opposite of that is when I go to bacterial pathogenesis meetings, everybody's talking about their streptococcus, their staph, or whatever. It's just secreting all kinds of nasty mm -hmm. toxins and creating damage. And I'm like, my bacteria just really wants to get along. It's, it's not trying to cause any damage. I feel kind of left out. But I think it's another you're... approach to pathogenesis. Uh, you're, you're almost in the science fiction area with this. And, and this is what I mean. <laughs> No, I'm serious. Think about the fact that in the mouse, you don't want to be noticed and you don't want to cause any negative effects. 
what if you're manipulating the mouse to repair damage more effectively than uninfected mice? And it's not, that it's not impossible. Yeah. But I'd say there's no evidence. And no, related no, but, to that, a lot of people have been doing studies like, does Borrelia do anything to the tick? <laughs> and there's been several papers, but you know, everything that I've seen is sort of a post hoc, like, okay, we saw mm -hmm. a difference and okay, we'll invent a reason why we might be seeing this difference. Um, and ticks have got tiny little brain like ganglia clusters. It's not like a lot to manipulate. And and how something that is hanging out in the midgut could possibly signal to the little uh, the nervous system of the tick to change its behavior. Um, there's no indication that that happens. So I think it's yeah. wishful thinking. It's not impossible yeah, well, to see it happens. All you have to do is set up experiments to investigate it, and you have to be con you have to be willing to accept data that doesn't support your hypothesis. And sometimes that's difficult because we really want something to be true. Yeah. yeah, like I said, a lot of people have tried and nobody has shown anything that I, I would really think is secret. Brian, thinking about uh, more practical advice that the listeners and viewers might have, we've all heard about like tick repellents. And I don't know how a lot of them work, but I thought since you're the maestro of ticks, you might be able to tell us. Well, I don't tell the ticks what to do, but we, we try to understand them. And I've got I've got colleagues that definitely know more about uh, tick uh, sensory apparatus. But uh, by and large, Ixodes ticks um, have a behavior that we call questing, where they will go up on vegetation, on grass or branch or whatever, to the heights appropriate for whatever host they're looking for. Looking for a mouse, they go up an inch or so. And so they'll be on a little on the bit of vegetation and say so that they've got eight legs and they'll be holding on until they can sense a potential host coming by. And they're sensing a number of things. Uh, carbon dioxide is a real cue to a bird. A lot of blood feeding arthropods detect carbon dioxide. Um, some can have sort of vestigial eyes so they can see dark and light. So if it's sunny and it becomes dark, that tells you something is going on. Uh, there's often components of sweat and other, you know, aromatics that our bodies emit. And the ticks have, on their forelegs, they have little organs which behave very much like noses. And they're picking up on the carbon dioxide and those volatiles that we do. And when a tick detects there's a potential host nearby, they do this behavior where they let go with their front legs and they wave their front legs out. And they're sniffing. And as you get closer, and if something brushes against it, the tip of every leg has a little hook, a little toenail. And if it brushes against something solid, the tick will grab on with that and it'll let go with all the other legs. And now suddenly it's on you. So say if you're walking along and then you look down like, oh my gosh, I got a tick on me. Did it jump? Did it fly? No. They're just very fast at transferring from one place to another one. So it detected you, grabbed on, and now the tick will wander around sensing, is this a good host? Does this smell right? You know, and some ticks are very, very fussy about what kind of a vertebrate they're going to feed on. And as we said, the ticks are going to feed for three to seven days. That's a long time. So you better be on something that you can survive and you're not going to get eaten or, you know, it's too small. Like you know, the adult Ixodes ticks feed on deer because if it fed on a mouse, first the mouse would find it because they're so big and eat it. But also, that that one tick would probably kill the mouse because it would process so much blood. So the, the ticks are wandering around. So people have probably found ticks walking around on themselves or walking around their dog, or the dog comes in and they find a tick in the house. It's because the tick decided this dog was not what I wanted. I dropped off, and I'm looking for something else. Right. But it's using those chemo sensors to uh, sniff. Uh, you saw the tick repellent works by being chemicals which – the basic understanding is they just mask those sensors so that the, the, the nose of the tick just can't detect um, the, the right things. Um, there are some also tick repellents. So, I mean, that's one way that a, a, an arthropod repellent could work. Another way would be that it, it doesn't taste good. It doesn't feel good. It's, it's kind of it's, it's, it's inhibitory. So if it got onto you 
it's like, oh, I, I don't like this. I, I got to get away and the tick will just jump off. This is really, really important for people to see because I, I was always of the idea that they weren't really careful about it. But what you're telling us is how specific and there's this beautiful interplay mm -hmm. um, that's just I, – I, mean, I know people don't like ticks, the idea of being fed on blood meals, but this is fascinating and beautiful. There's a lot of just amazing ecology uh, that's going on between the Borrelia, the ticks that they colonize – and then the animals that those ticks feed upon. If you look at a map of the United States or, or Europe and Asia, there's patches. And that happens to be where the right kind of tick that like to feed on people. Um, again, some ticks just don't like people. <laughs> so as we start to kind of phase out from our yeah. podcast today, I have just a couple questions for you. And, and the first is, what is something that everyone needs to remember about spirochetes? Just one thing you want everyone to remember from this. Hmm. I know there's so much. Spirochetes do it differently. Yes, you had mentioned that. And I think it's a nice reminder that not everything is like E. coli, that every organism has its own strategy. And sometimes we get jaded and think that the strategy we're most familiar with is the only one. And just like I see better with both eyes, I think having that microbial perspective really helps. Yeah. So I want to thank you for that. The second thing is, was there one particular experience that sold you on microbiology? I mean, for me, it was the first time that a friend of my brother handed me uh, a Petri dish with photobacterium and it glowed in the dark. I was sold. What about you? <laughs> I'd say it was a series of events. I, I went to college. Um, I wanted to be a veterinarian. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'd grown up in Utah. I went to Utah State University, which had the ag school. We had a pre-vet program. Uh, by the time, uh, well, pre-vets, basically pre-med, you take a lot of biology classes. So, you know, we we're all biology majors. I got a minor in chemistry because you end up a lot of chemistry classes. And our biology program like actually the pre-med or the pre-vet, you had to take introductory microbiology. And I liked it. Fred Post made it really engaging. Um, and i like, wow, this is really cool. You know, bacteria are, are neat. I'd be interested in studying infectious diseases or microbes or whatever. And our bachelor's program had areas of emphasis in biology. So you have to take a few extra classes. I like bacteria. I'm going to do that. And so I took, I think, two or three extra classes in microbiology. Uh, mm -hmm. I GA'd a micro lab uh, you know, back in the days of mouth pipetting the coli cultures. Yes. Uh, yeah. People, people were like, you did what? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we did. Yes, we did. <laughs> um, and one of my professors, John Takamoto, uh, John is still at Utah State. He's an emeritus professor now, I think. Sorry, if, if you're not. Um, Maybe he's still working full time. Um, was was one of my professors, and um, as a it was a microbial physiology class, and as a component of that class, you had to do some work in his laboratory. And so I worked in the lab for the first time. Like, wow, this is really really quite cool. I said I wasn't really interested in vet school anymore. I didn't know what else to do, so I applied to vet school. I didn't get in, and that is probably the you know the, one of the best things that ever happened. And John offered me an opportunity to work in his lab to get a master's degree. Uh, he decided they didn't have a strong PhD program, and it'd be best to get a PhD in someplace different from where I got my bachelor's degree. So I stayed there for two years, learned molecular genetics. Um, really, re really cool. And like, I am, I am set. I, I want to be a bacteriologist. So I went to SUNY Stony Brook. I worked with uh, E. coli gene regulation. As I said, I took a side trip onto eukaryotic gene regulation. But when the opportunity came back to work with bacteria, like, yes, this is really cool. And, you know, as uh, of late 80s uh, bacteriology, suddenly we're, okay, we antibiotic resistance is showing up. And suddenly we got Lyme disease in the Northeast. and All of these other bacterial diseases um, uh, were at the forefront. So I was very happy to get into that very fortunate to admit um, 
uh, Mark D'Souza, who introduced me to Steve Arthold, who uh, took a chance and let me into his lab and then moving on to Patty Rosa and Tom. And then I, I came to uh, University of Kentucky 26 years ago. And been having a lot of fun playing with bacteria ever since. Fun is the operative word here. Yes, it is. Right? It, and, and it really is fun every day. You go to the bench and you find out something new. And it's 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 really interesting to me. Yes, well, I don't think I'm that old, but, you know, people say, so when are you going <laughs> to retire? And I'm like, why do I want to retire? This is really cool. This is a fun job. Every day we're solving mysteries. And I don't even know what mysteries we're going to be working with next year. You know, this is not like I want to just hang it up and go fishing. I sounded really boring. I, we're fishing in the lab. There's I, a lot I, of cool stuff that's waiting to be caught. I, I just want my own lab. <laughs> <laughs> well, well Brian, come on over. You. <laughs> yeah, we got some space. Well, thank you so much for an opportunity to talk about something that I know a lot of folks are interested in. I really appreciate the joy that you find in microbiology. And I want to wish uh, you and your research group and your loved ones the very best. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. This has been Matters Microbial, a weekly podcast about the wonders of our microbial world and the people who study it. You can send questions, suggestions, or comments to me at mattersmicrobial at gmail.com. Show notes from today's episode with some tasty links, can be found at microbe.tv slash mm. If you like our work, please consider supporting us at microbe.tv slash contribute. I'm Doc Martin, and you can find me in the biology department of the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Dr. Brian Stevenson is in the College of Medicine at the University of Kentucky. Many, many thanks to David Renata for superb editing and Reber Clark for the wonderfully quirky music. It's always a pleasure to hear it. I hope you've enjoyed being part of our Quality Quorum today. See you in two weeks on Matters Microbial.